that's a, a gala apple person, uh, and I can do the gala, uh, but I am uh, pretty much by the book Red Delicious uh, in general. I'm not. I like the Red Delicious too soft. I like a hard apple. The old wine sap is the. You like uh, the to the break best. your teeth right I like off on the break your teeth. Exactly. If you're not right. snapping a tooth, it ain't a good apple. <laughs> that's right. And that's why you carry a knife with you to cut them up in uh, slices. <laughs> like so. a good dense apple, spackling, <laughs> like a spackling kind of apple. Red Delicious, when you bite into it, all the syrup all comes down your cheek and then your chest. And yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> what kind of an apple are you eating? I like I not. I get that kind of mess out of Yeah, apple. oh, I do with a red delicious. What are you doing? So, it's running down your chest. Yeah, yeah. You've never had that with a red delicious. I have never had that kind of juice flow. From yeah. An apple. Well, you've had you've had bad red delicious. No, I don't know. They seem to be pretty good. Maybe I'm they're, missing out they're, on they're something. Tasty, yeah. But. Yeah. Uh, financial Phil joins us via telephone. Phil, what's your favorite apple? Uh, yeah, I don't have a pre- I don't have a preference. Oh, I Phil, to, that's I not like you. Them. You have opinions. You got to have an opinion, Phil. <laughs> you know what? I'm not. I, I don't. I'm, I'm not a huge apple guy. What? But I guess if I had to pick one, it would be a Red Delicious. If I had to pick one. Ah, uh, you're just but conceding to Rob. Right, you have not thought that I'm, through. I love your opinion <laughs> there. More, no, I didn't think. I didn't think it through. You're right. But I'm more. Of, I'm, I'm like a monkey. I like bananas. Always value <laughs> Phil's opinion. Bananas. Uh, Dylan, what's your favorite apple over there? I'm a I'm a golden delicious. Golden delicious? Ah, yeah. that's even worse than a red delicious. Uh, oh. Served everywhere. <laughs> Bill's a mess over there. I, I haven't had any of these sloppy apples. Though. I, I don't recall anything. Bill is eating apples I'm not aware of. They're just exploding all over him every time he takes a bite. Of, I got yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pampered though. Maybe it's um, my wife cuts them up for me, so maybe that's why she gives me apple slices like that, you would if you were eating. That's different. You can get away with it to have apple slices, yeah. but if you're just biting into them like Rob's describing, it's kind of messy. Rob, you need a lot of handkerchiefs, <laughs> a she, lot of napkins. Phil, does your wife cut the crusts off the bread for you too? Used to. No, I, I like the crust, but she would. Oh, mercy. Uh, Phil, before we get uh, uh, further down the road on apples, uh, Dylan still has his headsets on. So uh, I think it's uh, it's Dylan versus Philan right here with the Steelers and the Ravens both winning yesterday atop the AFC North at four and two apiece, Phil. Yeah, and Dylan mentioned it when I called in this morning that it, it, it does still feel like there's a different, uh, a different uh, mood within the fan bases. I'm certainly glad the Steelers won yesterday, but they really couldn't accomplish much yesterday beating beating the Raiders. The Raiders aren't very good. And I like to say, now look, I've, I've got full confidence in, in the black and gold, but at this moment at 4-2, and two, especially the way Dallas looked against Detroit, I would have felt better if Dallas, even I'm not a Dallas fan, but I would have felt better if they would have beaten Detroit. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we lost to a good team at home. It appears as if we lost to a bad team at home is what it feels like. So we may be the best average team in the NFL at this point, <laughs> the very best average team in the league. And there's like 10 teams, but of those 10 teams, you'd have to say the Steelers are the best average team in the league. Until, and I know they put up 32 points yesterday, but until they get a more potent offense. Now, one of those touchdowns probably shouldn't have counted. That late hit call on Justin Fields when he threw a pick was awful. But uh, he threw a terrible interception uh, there was a, a quarter, roughing the uh, quarterback penalty, and I guess it is what it is. But to me, that penalty is way too drastic for what it was. I mean, that, that, that gave the Steelers the ball back and moved them up to like a three-yard line. But, uh, but on the other hand, the Ravens have won four in a row. They've beaten some good teams. But don't you fret, Dylan. When they come to Pittsburgh, we all know what's going to happen. Lamar Jackson, Pittsburgh is Lamar Jackson's kryptonite. So I do feel good about that game. I may even go to it. Well, listen. I think maybe Heinz Field was was the uh, was the kryptonite, not Acrisure Stadium. It's a little different. You know, I think it might be a little different. Here's the question I have, now. <laughs> Phil. September yes, five, nineteen oh six, St. Louis University's football team invented the first legal <laughs> forward pass. John Heisman is the man who lobbied to make sure it was legal. Why 118 years, one month, and yesterday being the 13th, eight days later, is it so hard for a Steelers quarterback to throw a forward pass? <laughs> I don't know. They, 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 since Big Ben, as, uh, 
hurt his elbow. So even when Big Ben, in like his last few years, you have to remember this is the same offense we saw with Big Ben after his elbow injury. But before that, you know, they had one of the more prolific passing offenses in the league. But since, uh, we're lacking a player. You know, we're lacking one of those guys. And part of what we love about the Steelers is also part of the reason why they don't have one. They're never high enough up in the draft where they can get C.J. Stroud or they can get um, uh, uh, Caleb Williams or any of these number okay, one or number okay, two. Okay, I, I get that. But, but th- those, are, those are potential franchise Super Bowl caliber type quarterbacks you're mentioning. Still. There are other college quarterbacks out there who play football and throw forward passes. Why is it when they put on a Steeler uniform, they suddenly don't remember how to throw a football forward successfully? Yeah, it, it can't be that the hard. There, there's got to be average quarterbacks out there who can complete a forward pass. Throw it yeah, downfield and complete Rudolph was there. We didn't like him. Mason Rudolph did a terrific job. The average quarterback that kind of led us to the playoffs last year and we didn't re-sign him. But... Um, yeah, I mean, it's just – it's the players we have. And I like Justin Field. I, I do. I really do. I like him. Going but back to his I, Netflix I, I really QB1 do. show. Yeah, I, I really, really like him. And, I, and I, like his, I like his game. But our passing, our passing offense right now is anemic. And I don't know if it's is it Justin Field. Is, I don't think it's the receivers. I just don't. But the um, – you know, our, our, our passing offense is bad. But we're 4 2. So, Can you imagine – so the Steelers' offense takes me back to September 4, 1906, every time I watch it, the day before the forward pass was legalized, Phil. But I'm, I'm thinking, like, what was that first game like? Like, that head coach in 1906 must have been thinking, wait till they see what I got coming up in this game. No one's ever done it before. <laughs> this is going to change the whole game. We're going to throw the ball forward. That memo hasn't reached Pittsburgh yeah. yet. <laughs> no, no I, I, but, you know, and- in their defense, yesterday they didn't really need to. No, they ran the ball well yesterday, but it was the right. Yeah, they didn't really need to throw the ball. You like, know what I think the issue is, Rob, is I think we maybe overestimate how many actually good quarterbacks there are in the NFL. I think, I you know, there's 32 teams in the NFL. I just pulled up the ringer, Steven Ruiz, his quarterback rankings over here. You get to number 18, you're already talking about Derek Carr. So that's uh, close yeah. to half of the league where you're like, I, I guess this guy is uh, okay. Mm-hmm. But the other thing but is. But it can be that hard to throw the ball for. Yeah. These kids do it from the time they're in youth. <laughs> yeah, but being good in the NFL is not enough. You have to be great to make a, to carry a team. Well, I don't want them to carry the team, but I would like to see a ball completed 15 <laughs> yards downfield between the hashes. The Steelers either throw it 40 yards down the sideline or sideways. That's it. Those are our two routes, sideways or 40 <laughs> yards down the Safe. sideline. Safe. He did have a really good a really good uh, uh, touchdown pass. It was called back because it was a foot over the line of scrimmage. That was a good throw. Phil, you're not going to win this discussion with Rob this morning. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Phil, let's talk small Please. cap stocks. Small cap stocks. You used to talk about the Russell 2000 index a lot, and I haven't heard you mention it in a year. Why? Yeah, so it has not been a year. We just talked about it a few months ago, but I did. So this morning on your year. request, so small cap stocks, Russell 2000, one of the more volatile asset classes that we have exposure to, and most likely all of us do to some extent in our portfolios, probably through mutual funds. TSP, and they have a small cap index in there as well. But one of the more volatile indexes. And if you look over the long haul, one of the more profitable indexes as well. So you have smaller companies, therefore they are they are a little bit more volatile. There's a better chance of failure, but also a greater chance of skyrocketing. So all these big companies that we look at, at one point they made a stop in the small cap and then the mid cap and now they're large capitalization. Was over this year, if you look year to date, the Russell 2000 trails all of our major large cap index, S&P, NASDAQ, and Dow. I don't know I'll talk about the Dow, but S&P and the NASDAQ. And it trails it by a good bit. But if we shrink that down a little bit, so since we've been in this perception and it has started to become reality in a, in a falling interest rate environment, the Russell has actually outperformed the S&P and the NASDAQ since July. And this is the – the and here it all comes back to the Federal Reserve again. I know I'm, I'm feeling eye rolls all over Berkeley County, but it is accurate because the broadening of the market 
is occurring because we're in a falling interest rate environment, even though we got CPI and PPI numbers last week that didn't quite meet expectations. For the moment, that's seen as a bump in the road. What it may bring about, and we could see the Russell even fall some this week due to this, uh, in, during earnings season, we could see the Russell fall because now the, the conversation is around, does the Federal Reserve need to cut at their next meeting? And if that's the case, we could see a pause in this rally from the small cap index. But make no mistake about it, small caps are probably in your portfolio. How much, how much exposure is in there is to be seen. It depends on how aggressive you are in your portfolio. But they, it is very volatile on the up and the downside. And we've seen that. I don't think there's full recovery since 2022 yet in the small cap index. But it's on its way back. So if you're looking, if you're like, hey, I still want to find – some of these equity markets that's not fully recovered, but you have to be very, very careful. There's also a ton of companies in the Russell or in the small cap index because they're small, right? So they, they never made it to be large. Look at that number at the end of it. That's how many companies. So it's difficult to pick and, and choose winners in the Russell 2000. So sometimes people get it by way of exchange-traded funds or, or in separately managed accounts. But the, but the uh, small cap index – that is often ignored, ignored, very little talked about, can be the tail that wags the dog, and it may be for the rest of this year if we continue on with this falling interest rate environment. Phil, for tutorial again, we use the term big and small cap uh, very easy. Is there a quantitative definition for small cap? Yes, there is, and it's the, it's the overall market capitalization and off the top of my head, even though I've taken it on, uh, on many tests. The, I, I don't know it off of the top of my head. I bet John does. But the, the it's it's how much capitalization or what the value of a publicly traded company is. So if you took all the shares up and it's trading for X amount and it, it can't reach a certain level, once it extends past that level, now it falls into the mid cap. And, of course, then it, as it goes up, it gets into the large cap. But it is a quantitative value. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Phil, uh, one of the stocks of interest, and I'm using this as kind of a, a, a point, of, uh, point of discussion, point of interest, is SpaceX and what it's doing trying to get the astronauts back from the uh, uh, space station. But there was a clip this past weekend, uh, the booster uh, on Sunday, and how the boosters recovered, uh, and it went through a very small, small ring did, uh, to, back to the launch pad. Did you see that by chance? I, d I didn't see that, and I, I know very little about that. Cause I was uh, I was dismissed from the world as I was driving to and from yeah. Charleston, South Carolina. So what little bit I could listen to uh, was was interrupted by talking into the car and so forth. But I didn't see any of that. My apologies for it. Well, you'll you'll probably see clips of it on various uh, news events, but it was just no nothing short of spectacular how this massive, massive twenty foot story high booster came back and fit itself inside a relatively small ring. Uh, so it was like a, uh, a, a game that you would play, but it was just spectacular. But it has nothing to do with investment, but I found it of interest. I, I did want to back up and give you I wanted to look up. I was embarrassed that I didn't know this off the top of my head. A small cap stock is a company with a market capitalization of $3 million to two billion so if it fits into that range 300 million i said three million 300 million to two billion then it qualifies to be a small cap stock and that that sounds like it's a it's a huge company but they're actually not yeah two billion would sound like a pretty yeah. big company yeah. wouldn't it yeah. right to me yes. to me it but does. after it gets to two billion then it falls into the mid cap well my wife has in her tsp plan she's got uh, uh, index s p 500 basically an index fund i think they call that the c fund in, uh, in in the TSP plan, and there's a small cap fund in there as well. And small caps, uh, maybe I don't know, six seven years ago, were actually outpacing the S and P pretty convincingly uh, many years. And then yeah. as interest rates ticked up, that's that's obviously changed yeah. significantly. Yeah. But, so when you look at the at the big picture with small caps, although they're more volatile, they often do. Depending on when you look at the snapshot, they often do outperform. Uh, the, the larger companies, but you've got to accept that volatility that comes along with it. And that's what a lot of investors aren't willing to do is to accept that volatility and chance of failure. We haven't heard much about bonds recently. What, how are they doing, Phil? 
Uh, bonds have done extremely well, say, almost in the same time frame as small caps, even though they're the polar opposite when you look at standard deviation and what they could do on the upside and downside. Uh, they're, they're, they're on the opposite sides of the spectrum, but they're being driven by the same thing. And, you know, while the, the stock market broadens and that, that helps the, the small cap stocks, as that's going on with rates coming down or in a falling interest rate environment, that helps the bond. So if you in a window, if you look, let's go back to 2022, which was an awful year for stocks and bonds due to the same reason. If you look at these bonds over the last three or four months, they have they have done exceedingly well compared to what they were doing in 2022. And that's another asset class as a, as a whole that hasn't quite recovered from that fall in 2022 yet. But as we continue on with this falling interest rate environment, that will boost bonds. Now, that's not a solicitation to go out and say, hey, I'm going to get rich off bonds because the ceiling or the, the best that you're going to do on bonds isn't that great. You know, it's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you may get a look at your bonds and say, hey, a G fund, if you will, since we were talking about TSP, you say, hey, I got an 8 or 9% return during that year. Well, that's great. But that standard deviation, you know, the, 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 the high end and the low end of how they can perform is much smaller with bonds than it is in small cap or, or in any equity, really. So, but they have done well as, as, as compared to what bonds would do. They have done well over the last three or four months. So that for you conservative investors out there that saying, hey, how come everybody talks about they have recovered from 2022, but I'm not really seeing that. You're not seeing it because you've got an abundance of bonds in your portfolio, and they haven't experienced that quite yet. But as rates continue to fall, bonds should prosper. Uh, Phil, over the last year, there's been deflation on a host of fronts, energy, food, and the like. But when you extend it back to prior to COVID or during the early stages of COVID, it's still very high. Uh, uh, the inflation. Uh, is there any chance at all that we will see pre-COVID prices? I, I I hate to say this because everyone's going to say, "What do you mean?" But I hope not. And the reason I say I hope not is as a basket of goods as our economy is measured. If we see deflation and it takes us back to those same kind of prices that we saw in 2019, that is a very very bad sign for the economy. And it's really hard to like explain that because as a consumer, there's two of us. There's everyone that's got investments. You're, there's the consumer side of you, and then there's the investor side of you. But if prices are coming down as a basket, you'll see it periodically. You may see it, especially with energy. That's why inflation is uh, one of the measures removes energy and food because of the ups and downs of it. But as a, as a whole, as our economy is measured, we don't want to see def- deflation. We want to see slowing inflation, and if we see slowing inflation, that just means prices are rising more slowly than what they were before. But for the economy, overall deflation is very bad. It's like a spiral, and it's very difficult, very difficult to stop. And one small economic example is if you look at uh, Black Friday, and everybody talks about, especially me, I get to be scroogey around Christmas time. One of the reasons is is we start to have Christmas sales in October and September and and now Amazon Christmas in July. Well, one of the reasons that keeps getting uh, moved back is if there's major sales, what what does people buy? What do people buy the week before Black Friday? The answer is nothing, not much. So retailers have said, hey, we've got to find a way to fill this gap because consumers, if you think it's going to be cheaper later, you won't buy it today. You won't. You will wait. And then that's why it's so difficult to get out of deflation. So what retailers in, in, in our economy have started to do is start to scooch that back a little bit. We've got to fill this hole because we're not selling anything. We've got a, a inventory built up. They're anticipating a sale. So let's scooch it back and let's have this Cyber Monday sale or let's have this small business. Uh, I don't even know what the day of the week is, Saturday or whatever it may be. And then Amazon, what the biggest retailer in the country probably, said, well, let's just grab it and do it in, in mid-July because we don't want people to wait. You know, I've seen clients and people in our office that have already started purchasing Christmas gifts because they because of these sales that, that are popping up out of nowhere. Prime Day, that's all happening because 
of prices being reduced in the future and they continue to scooch the sales back. So we play that out to the broader economy as consumers. If we think that prices are going to drop in the future on discretionary items like travel or goods or goods and services, televisions, whatever, we won't buy it today. It's until they change our consumers' minds that, hey, you've got to get this now because it's not going to be any cheaper later. That's one of the reasons it was difficult to get out of uh, consumer spending and consumer confidence. We said, hey, that was one of the issues that was driving inflation. Our consumers continue to buy stuff because their perception was it's not getting any cheaper. It's going to continue to go up, so I may as well get it now. Well, that's also the same in reverse. If things are going to be cheaper, if we believe they're going to be cheaper later, we won't buy it today. That's disinflation, or, or I'm sorry, deflation, and that's a bad thing for our economy. So back to answer your question, I hope not. I hope we don't get back to that because if we do, it's a result of a very bad thing. You mentioned Christmas. Uh, with the uh, uh, dock uh, strike that we had uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, that lasted only one or two days, uh, I was surprised to find that most retailers had already bought all their Christmas stock. And so the uh, the dock strike as in terms of Christmas did not really bother them because they were fully stocked at that point. And that was one of the reasons why it got settled quickly, uh, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. they realized they weren't going to be disrupting yeah. anything, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point to how some of these these Christmas sales and how do we how do we disengage from – uh, deflation in in our store or in our for our holiday season. Well, that's why they're stocking up for Christmas because there's already Christmas sales going on at, at periodically. At certain stores are saying, "Hey, before the holidays, get it now, get it, get it before the rush," and all these different things. And that's why they stocked up. And, and you're and you're right. Now, I do think you know with that that uh, that uh, the the whole strike on the on the on the docks. Is going to have some sort of impact. It won't. I don't think it'll be immediate, but it's going to have some sort of impact, even if it's on the cost of shipping. We've all seen this sort of thing when, when oil prices go up, they're quick to increase the prices. That really rubs robbed the wrong way. So if oil prices go up, the very next morning you see gas prices go up. But when they go down, it takes a couple of weeks before we see it at the pump. Well, that's going to be an excuse to increase the price of shipping or increase the price of whatever service we're paying for to get free shipping, that could be impacted because now we're paying them so much more and there was a little bit of a backlog at these ports. My wife was looking at uh, buying a dress for uh, my son's wedding for a rehearsal dinner. And she was eyeballing this dress, I think on the Macy's website, it was $100. And she kept waiting it out and waiting it out and eventually bought it for $15, Phil. Mm. 15 Why? Wow. Now, i tell you this. You want to, you want to lower prices in the country? You put my wife in charge of purchasing. <laughs> <laughs> you want you want to keep prices high? Let men do the purchasing because we don't want to shop. We're like, yeah, just give it to me, get it over with. I want to get out of this store, get out of this website, whatever. Yeah, be done with it. That's how you that's, that's how you save money. That's a drastic cut. Uh, huge. What what that's prompted? Do you know? Cut. Yeah. Bill, I don't investigate Macy's I don't pricing <laughs> strategy. It's all I know is she was you, happy. You throw out an interesting point. That's all point. I cared about. You, you throw out an interesting point, which just begs for an explanation, she, Rob. She waited it out. I don't, know. I don't know. The only thing I'm left with is your wife just bought a very ugly dress that nobody else wanted. That's the only. You're going to have to find out why that price dropped. Oh, he's baiting you, Rob. He's baiting you. Rise to the occasion. <laughs> I'm not wearing the dress. <laughs> what, do, what do I care? So you, so you say. Yeah. <laughs> You, you've mentioned some pretty uh, uh, pretty delicate ground there, Phil. Phil, we are out of time, man. Thanks thanks so much for yours. Have a good day, sir. Thank you, guys. Okay, so Phil.